What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Danielle Hallen and I am back with another true crime video. And today we're going to be speaking about yet another absolutely heartbreaking disappearance of a young child. In my most recent video, I spoke about the disappearance and presumed death of six-year-old Noel Rodriguez Alvarez. And after I covered that, I was absolutely bombarded with emails and case suggestions about a very similar case of a six-year-old little girl named Oakley Carlson that was last seen back in 2021, but wasn't actually reported missing for almost an entire year. Her biological parents, who technically had custody of her at the time of her disappearance, have to this day remained uncooperative to say the absolute least. Since been convicted of multiple other crimes, not directly regarding Oakley's case, um, but actually in regards to their neglect of another one of their children amongst just other crimes that they were a part of. And Oakley's foster parents who had hoped to one day adopt her are the ones that have taken this head on trying to bring Oakley home. And those foster parents, Jamie Jo and Eric Hiles, had raised the alarm numerous times to DCYF during the time they were fostering Oakley. And even after the fact, this all could have been prevented. Before I get into the details of the case, I first want to say a huge thank you to Kara for collaborating with me on today's video. Kara is an absolutely awesome subscription service that delivers personalized vitamins and supplements straight to your door. Now, health has always been a really huge priority for me, but if you're anything like me, supplements can make you very easily overwhelmed. I literally walk down the vitamin and supplement aisle, freak out, turn around and leave. And care of has made it that much easier to take care of myself by taking out all of the guesswork. They personalize your supplements based on your needs after taking a quick quiz. And my favorite part about it is the fact that it can evolve with you. I'm constantly changing my diet, my habits. And care of helps you to track your progress, how you're feeling. And if you feel like something maybe needs to be changed, all you have to do is retake the quiz and it'll give you new suggestions. Your vitamins and supplements are sent straight to your door in little personalized packets that are absolutely adorable. All you have to do is pull one out every morning, toss it in your bag if you're someone on the go, and you have everything you need right there. And since the packets are made from plant-based films, you can compost them once you're done with them, which is a huge win in my book. I have gone back and retaken the quiz a handful of times in the years that I have been using Care Of, but there's two things that are always, 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 always in my vitamin packs that I cannot live with out and that's rhodiola for stress and magnesium for um, your muscles. It helps a lot with muscle recovery and also bone health. I'm also a huge fan of their plant protein powders. Pro tip, mix the chocolate flavor with chocolate pudding and thank me later. You can take care of quiz to see what vitamins and supplements are recommended for you. Just click the link down below in the description box and use my code Danielle50 for 50% off your first order with care of. Thank you again to care of for partnering with me on today's video. It is brands like Care Up that allow me to do what I do and contribute back to families and organizations that I believe in as much as possible. So to get into the details, Oakley was born on December 6, 2016 to Jordan Bowers, her mother, and Andrew Carlson, her father, in Oakville, Washington. She's one of four siblings, with the oldest being from one of Jordan's previous relationships. And just months after Oakley was born, for some reason or another, her biological parents' lives were went very quickly downhill. The couple first met when Andrew was an Aberdeen police officer, then a monumental fall from grace. He lost his badge and commission in 2017 for making false and misleading statements. His relationship with Jordan described as volatile, fueled by meth. Court documents showing Andrew was the more responsible parent to the three kids they shared, while Jordan was out hitting the slots and the pipe. Her first love in life is to gamble. Would she befriend, say, men or older men at the casino or strangers? All the above to get money, for sure. And I'm not sure if it's directly related to the loss of his job or if maybe this is a problem that had been going on since this couple met. But according to reports, they had a very tumultuous, aggressive relationship filled with yelling, uh, domestic violence, and unfortunately, it's been said to have been, quote, fueled by drugs, in particular, methamphetamine. And so clearly, this is just not a very safe safe environment for the kids. It's not a healthy situation for either parent. So by September of 2017, their drug use and behavior led to them losing the custody of all of their children. And again, I can't seem to find specifics on what exactly happened, but 
all of the children were removed from the home and put into foster care, I believe except for the oldest who went to live with his biological father. Now, Oakley in particular, the little girl who's the subject of this entire video, went to live with an absolutely amazing couple, Eric and Jamie Jo Hiles. Now, this situation kind of fell in their lap and was an absolute dream come true for them. Jamie Jo is a teacher in Washington and had been randomly reached out to one day back in 2017 by a former student asking if she would be able to foster this little baby girl who was, I believe, like somewhere between seven and nine months old. And Jamie Jo and Eric jumped at this opportunity. They had always wanted to be parents. And from what I have seen, they had been struggling to conceive. And so this was an awesome opportunity for them. And so Oakley was welcomed into their hearts and their home. And at the time they had absolutely no idea how long this arrangement was going to be for, but they did know that they were going to be the best parents they absolutely could be for this little baby girl. And Oakley, sure enough, absolutely blossomed into this beautiful little growing child while in the Hiles care. She is wildly intelligent. They have shared so many photos and videos through social media, um, through this Paramount episode that I have linked down below. And you can just see how happy Oakley is. She's empathetic. She's incredibly full of love. There is rarely a moment where you see Oakley without a huge smile plastered on her face. She's always dancing around a room, telling or laughing at her own jokes. You know Oakley, you know that she loves you because she is just the kind of kid that makes sure you know that, whether that's with a hug or a kiss or just telling you or having to have a hand at you at all times. She's just an absolute sweetheart of a child. And nine times out of 10, she fell asleep in the Hiles home, surrounded by dozens of books that she had begged Jamie Jo and Eric Hiles to read for her at bedtime. She makes her presence known. She was known by absolutely everyone at Jamie Jo's school that she worked at. She even made sure she was a part of their dance team, wanted to be one of the big girls and just put herself right in the middle of everything. She's just so full of life, despite being in such tough circumstances and having, you know, this very delicate stage of her life disrupted, she knew that she was loved by the Hiles. She knew that she was in safe hands and she was thriving and knowing that she was then subsequently taken away and then failed by so many people shatters my heart into hundreds of thousands of pieces. This little girl is only a couple months apart from my youngest son. I cannot fathom how anyone could possibly not do their absolute most to protect a child like that. Now, obviously the goal in foster care is typically reunification. Um, that's the main goal. You don't want children to be taken away from their families. You don't want that disruption in their life. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it's not a fairy tale ending. Sometimes there are just too many dangers. There's not enough change and it's not a safe situation and they are better off in foster care. However, again, the end goal is to help these families, to be there for them, give them the resources that they need and the healing they need to come back together. And so this was also the goal with Oakley. They wanted to help both Jordan and Andrew get into a better position, work on their drug use, work on their violence and move forward to be able to have a happy family. And so it was a very very huge and sudden yet kind of exciting change for the Hiles family when Oakley's plan was very suddenly changed to adoption by DCYF in July of 2018. And at this point, she had been in foster care with the Hiles for about a year. Now, I'm unsure what exactly led to this change in the permanent plan for Oakley, and I'm not sure how much of that information was even shared with the Hiles either, but my assumption is that it likely had a lot to do with the parents' continued decline throughout that last year. Um, when it comes to DCYF and having your children taken out of your care, especially when it's particularly pertaining to something like drug use, usually there's required drug testing, um, potentially some programs you have to participate in. And I don't know what exactly was required of this family by DCYF, but I'm assuming it was a handful of those things. And I don't know if that went well or if it didn't and if maybe that contributed. But what I do know is that the same month that Oakley's long-term plan was changed to adoption. Her biological father, Andrew, had been arrested and charged with assault 
for attacking Jordan, Oakley's mother. So violence a year after the children had been taken from the home was clearly still playing a huge part in this couple's relationship, which is obviously still not conducive to a healthy and happy home life. Andrew was ordered because of this to have a domestic violence evaluation. And based on their recommendation, he was required to complete a treatment program. And all of these opportunities, again, were put in place to try to ensure that they at some point were able to get their children back in their custody. There were all these different opportunities laid out there for them. Andrew and Jordan just needed to take them and put the effort in. Meanwhile, Oakley is still in the loving care of the Hiles, but over the next few months, a handful of alarming incidents end up happening with Oakley that started to raise a lot of red flags with Jamie, Joe, and Eric. I'm unsure if anything had happened in this first year of foster care, but from this point on, it was just one problem after another. Oakley had been going on supervised visits with Jordan and Andrew. Again, when it comes to foster care, it's incredibly important to continue to nurture relationships. Um, you never want to completely cut off a relationship. If there's ever a goal of sending the child back, um, you don't want that bond to be severed. And according to Jamie Joe, despite the fact that Oakley's permanent plan had been changed to adoption, she noticed that these visits continued to increase leading up to the summer of 2019. And one of these visits led Jamie Joe to send a complaint to DCYF in regards to Oakley's biological parents. Oakley had gone for a two hour supervised, supervised visit with Jordan and Andrew. And according to Jamie Jo, she was returned back to her foster parents in a soiled diaper that had very obviously not been changed in the entirety of the visit. On top of that, Oakley had red marks going down her cheek, which in my opinion, looked like scratches. Jamie Jo approached the supervisor and said, hey, I'm concerned about the state in which Oakley returned back home. And for some reason, the supervisor who should have been present during this entire visit couldn't seem to find any answer at all for the scratches on Oakley's face. So Jamie Jo reached out above the supervisor to Oakley's caseworker. She was hoping there would be some sort of response now that she went a step higher. There was absolutely none. Her concerns were completely shrugged off. And to add to the worry that they were already feeling, DCYF ended up being notified just a few months later in May of 2019 that Andrew had actually been kicked out of the domestic violence treatment program that he was required to complete successfully. Quote, this letter is to notify you of Mr. Carlson's failure to comply with his domestic violence treatment program. Mr. Carlson has failed to attend his group sessions since April 1st, 2019. 2019. This has resulted in Mr. Carlson's discharge from our program. And even from a third party view looking in, it's very obvious to see that there are still a lot of issues within this family. There is an active domestic violence charge, a failure to comply with the court orders, questionable supervised visits, and neither couple had a job at this time either. So there was this question of how they would be able to provide for their children, which is why it was an absolute jaw dropping shock in September. September of 2019, when the Hiles received an email letting them know that Oakley was going to be returned to her biological parents by January of 2020. Despite everything that I just listed, they felt that the situation was safe and things had progressed in a way that they were happy with. So Oakley was okay to go back home. Now, obviously coming out of left field and knowing what they knew, the Hiles had genuine concerns about this decision. And so they wanted to speak to DCYF about it personally. And on October 11th, 2019, there was a meeting with Oakley's caseworker. Jamie Joe and Eric listed out all of their different worries and that they were really concerned something was going to happen to Oakley if she went back to her biological parents. According to Jamie Joe, there was absolutely no understanding in terms of their concerns. Instead, they were both met with Oakley's not your daughter and being poor isn't a reason for someone to not have their children, which of course that's definitely not a valid reason for someone not to have their children, uh, but domestic violence is, um, failure to care for your child is. And so it was absolutely 
mind boggling that it seemed that no one was listening, taking the Hiles concerns seriously. Once it was decided that Oakley was going to be placed back in her parents' care, they obviously started to change different things about her schedule. For instance, they decided to start unsupervised visits to try and ensure that this transition went smoothly. And in late October, there was yet another incident where Oakley came home from one of these trips saying incredibly alarming things. Oakley told her foster family that while she had been with her biological parents, she witnessed personally her mom hit her dad. And there is a a video of Oakley speaking about this instance where she even imitates what her father looked like, screaming in an absolute rage. So just as they had done before, they took this information, they took this video to DCYF to again alert them that there was still violence occurring in the home and it was occurring in front of the children. But yet again, instead of taking Jamie Jo and Eric seriously, they were told that there wasn't anything to worry about and that Oakley really loved her parents and would tell them that as if somehow that made what was happening okay. And so without hesitation, these unsupervised visits soon transitioned into overnight visits. Upon hearing this, Jamie Jo, in a last ditch effort, tried to yet again raise concerns to DCYF. This time her concerns just weren't even entertained at all. They totally skipped past them and responded with, by the way, Oakley will not be going to her parents in January of 2020. She'll actually be going to her parents by the end of the month. So we're talking like less than two weeks away. And this was in November, so months earlier than planned. And immediately the Hiles were devastated. They fought back. They said, this is being rushed. We're super concerned. We're worried about Oakley's well-being. But at this point they had done everything that they possibly could have. They documented everything. They reported everything. They made sure to protect Oakley every way they were legally able to. And at this point, they had no choice but to hope that everything would be okay, that she would be all right. Days later on November 13th, despite Andrew failing to do anything that the court had asked him to in regards to the domestic assault, Somehow, some way, the assault charges ended up being entirely dropped, um, which is absolutely wild to me, especially since his child's well being was in the hands of the court. That is something that has been repeatedly said by DCYF. You would think that it would have been taken a little more seriously. And on November 19th, the Hiles had their very last few hours with Oakley before she was returned to Andrew and Jordan, having no idea that this would be the very last time they were going to see her, just a week before her third birthday. From the moment that that Oakley was returned to her biological parents, there's like a two year span where just not a lot is known about Oakley, her well being, what exactly was going on in the home, if DCYF was making frequent visits, if Jordan and Andrew were being drug tested. Everything is essentially up in the air, and it seems that no one really had their eyes on Oakley or any of her siblings to ensure that their home life remained safe. And this is likely how her disappearance went unnoticed for an entire entire year. This fast forwards us to November 6, 2021, almost two years exactly after Oakley was returned back to her biological parents. Minutes before 5 p.m. that day, a call came in to 911 from Oakley's dad, Andrew Carlson. Andrew proceeded to tell the dispatcher an absolutely bizarre, unbelievable story, saying that there had been a fire in the family home that had started at, get this, 10 in the morning. So it had been hours since this fire had started and he was for some reason just now calling to report it. And not just that, he wanted to tell the dispatcher exactly how it started. Andrew proceeded to say that one of his daughters, Oakley Carlson, had managed to set the couch on fire in their home using a cigarette lighter, but he reassured them that he had been able to get the fire under control and told the dispatcher that he didn't want anyone to come out to the scene, that there was no need for it. He just wanted to call and report the fire to have it documented. Little bit strange. This is an incredibly small community. 
As of 2021, I think the population is under 800. It's like 750 something. And when you have a town that is that small, everyone knows everything and word spreads so incredibly fast. And so pretty soon the entire community had heard about this fire and wanted to be able to help out in whatever way that they could, including a woman by the name of Jessica Swift, the principal at a local school, also attended by Oakley's older sister, her six-year-old sister. Now, not only was Jessica Swift the principal of the school, but she also had a daughter that was close friends with Oakley's six-year-old sister. And so being that much closer to the situation, she reached out to Jordan and offered to bring supplies for the family, which Jordan happily agreed to because they had lost a lot in the fire. So by November 10th, 2021, days later, Jessica Swift arrives at the home to give the family supplies, which as a little side note, Despite the fire, the family was continuing to live in the home, which is questionable in itself once you see photos of the fire, because the fire wasn't as small as this very nonchalant 911 call made it seem to be. Jessica Swift was at the family's home for about 45 minutes, and she noticed that two of the children were there. The oldest was off with his biological father. And after a while, she was like, you know what? I haven't seen Oakley. So she asked Jordan, hey, what's up with Oakley? Where is she at? Let me see her. I want to talk to her. And Jordan's response was, oh no, she's in her room. She's in timeout right now. And this wasn't too strange at the time. And so there weren't really any red flags raising, but that very, very quickly changes. Over the next couple of weeks, Jessica Swift, being the absolute angel that she is, continues to visit Jordan and Andrew, bringing them more supplies, making sure they have everything they need to take care of their children. And every single time, Oakley is nowhere to be seen. Sometimes it's the two-year-old and the six-year-old, sometimes the nine-year-old's there as well. But every time, there's always a new excuse as to why Oakley isn't there or she can't say hi to Oakley. And so Jessica ultimately gets this sinking feeling that something very wrong is going on here. And she was far, far from the only one. By early December, there was a random meeting held at the school. And during this meeting, Oakley ended up being brought up by someone else who was incredibly concerned about what was going on, worried that something strange was going on at Jordan and Andrew's house. And so at this point, Jessica's like, you know what? I have to take action because I have an off feeling. I haven't seen Oakley. Other people are noticing strange things. And so she came up with a plan. Jessica Swift reached out to Jordan pretty much immediately and said, hey, you wanna get together tomorrow to have a play date you know, with my daughter and then also with your six-year-old. And Jordan immediately agrees to this. It's gonna be a great time. And so after this play date, Oakley's six-year-old sister ends up asking if she can leave with Jessica Swift instead. She wants to go and be with her friend, have a little bit more time and have a sleepover and Jordan agrees with this. But when they get back to the safety of Jessica Swift's house, Oakley's sister says some pretty alarming things. As the night progressed, Jessica Swift ended up just bringing up Oakley in regular conversation, not thinking too much of it. And the moment she did that, Oakley's sister had a massive emotional reaction. Upon hearing her little sister's name, she proceeds to curl up in a ball on the couch and shake violently. She is absolutely hysterical. And Jessica, at this point, I'm sure, has hairs going up on the back of her neck, knowing that her gut feeling was likely right. And so she asked this little girl, she's like, hey, you know, what's going on here? Where is Oakley? Why are you upset? And all the little girl said was, there is no Oakley. Jessica didn't push the subject anymore that night. She did not want to upset Oakley's clearly distressed sister any longer. So she got the girls to bed. And the following day, which was Sunday, December the 5th, um, she decided to gently ask about Oakley again. And she's told by Oakley's six-year-old sister that Oakley had been bad. And so she was sent back to her foster parents to live with them. Now, right away, I'm sure this was a very conflicting feeling of, okay, either Oakley is somewhere that we know she is safe and loved, and that's all we can hope for, or there's something very wrong going on here. And so she wants to figure out which it is and decides to call the Grays Harbor Sheriff's Department, which is the county that Oakville is in, to confirm that Oakley is in fact back in foster care. Guess what? She had not been. According to all the information they had, Oakley was supposed to be in the care of her biological parents, Jordan and Andrew. Fear gripped 
Jessica. And she, at this point, did not want to give Oakley's older sister back to Jordan or Andrew because you just don't know what's going to happen at this point. There's obviously something wrong and she felt an obligation to protect this little girl. And so she ended up reaching out to Jordan again saying, hey, the girls are having a great time. Can I keep her one more night? I'll take them both to school in the morning. It'll be great. And Jordan again agrees. And so the next morning, Monday, December the 6th, which by the way, was Oakley's fifth birthday, Jessica Swift takes the girls to school and immediately calls to demand a welfare check on Oakley Carlson, knowing that there is a large chance something has happened to her. Now, at this point, the family had left their home. They were no longer living in the fire and had moved into an extended stay of America in a neighboring town of Tumwater, Washington. And so Gray's County Sheriff had no jurisdiction over this area. So they actually reached out to Tumwater PD and said, look, we need you to check on this little girl. And so they immediately sent 10 officers out to the hotel. And as authorities arrive, they knock on the door. Jordan answers. She's got the little two-year-old on her hip and clearly based on the state of the room behind her, they were packing up to go back home. So like nothing unusual, but they kind of had a feeling they were about to up and leave and wanted to get as much as they could out of them before they felt something was off and decided to instead just go who knows where. And so immediately they ask, where is Oakley? And Jordan gives a very bizarre answer. I mean, it's not really bizarre, but like the way it's worded is just strange. Her response is, Oakley is with mom. Okay, and so they're like, okay, mom, as in like, your mom, or like, what exactly? And she, she apparently meant like Oakley was with her, but she referred to her herself in third person. Um, and so authorities are like, okay, well, if Oakley is with mom, and that means that she is with you, we would like to see her. Is she here in this hotel room? And Jordan, at this point, immediately looks over to Andrew, who is off somewhere in the room, and says, hey, Andrew, is Oakley with your parents? Total change in story at this point, and Andrew quickly confirms, yeah, Oakley is with my parents. And so now authorities are like, okay, so you said Oakley is with mom, meaning Oakley was with you, but now that I asked to see her, you're saying Oakley is with her grandparents. And so they're like, at this point, we still have to confirm that Oakley is okay. We are on a welfare check. So we need the address and the phone number of her paternal grandparents you're claiming that she is with. And despite the fact that this is Andrew's father, despite the fact that um, this, from what I understand, is the home that he grew up in for 20 years, Andrew was suddenly like, I don't know their address and I have no idea what their phone number is. Authorities know this is obviously a load of crap. So after they push for a little while, Andrew finally cracks and gives them his parents' phone number. So right then and there, as they are all standing together, the police department of Tumwater calls up Andrew's parents and says, look, we've been told by Andrew and Jordan that Oakley, a child we're doing a welfare check on, is in your care. Can you confirm? And do you know what they say? No, we have not seen Oakley in almost a year. They had not seen Oakley since Christmas of 2020. And that last time that they did see her, gave some even scarier insight to authorities. Jordan, Andrew, and their kids had allegedly spent Christmas 2020 with Andrew's parents. And according to the grandmother, Andrew's mom, Oakley during this trip looked absolutely awful. She was pale. She was not herself. She had bags under her eyes. She looked sick. She looked uncared for. Enough so that she actually called CPS to report this, to say, look, I'm concerned about this little girl. Someone needs to check on her. Andrew and Jordan ended up finding out that she had been the one to call CPS and they stopped all contact. And on top of that, Oakley's grandmother was not even the only person to report on the way Oakley was appearing during this time, that she looked unwell. Jamie Jo was shown a picture shortly after Christmas of 2020. So she was shown around January of 2021. And it was from this Christmas vacation and she's looking at it and she's 
says, oh my God, it looks like Oakley has a black eye. She's pale, she looks unhealthy. So she also calls into DCYF and CPS to say, hey, look, Here's this picture. I will literally send it to you to show that Oakley does not look okay. There is something going on here. But as per usual, nobody was taking her seriously and she was actually replied to with, you're gonna get in trouble for false reporting if you keep on calling and saying these things about Oakley. Mind blown. So having this information, authorities are now pushing even harder to figure out where Oakley is. They, at this point, Jordan and Andrew become that much more uncooperative. They were actually becoming a bit combative. They were aggressive, angry. And so authorities have no choice at this point but to leave. So after that, they also wanted to double check and make sure that Oakley's grandparents weren't hiding her or something. So they go physically to their house to check for Oakley and were able to confirm she was not there. And again, out of an overabundance of caution, they reach out to DCYF just to make sure they're not missing something in terms of foster care or that she had been taken for one reason or another. Um, and sure enough, Oakley was in fact supposed to be with her biological parents. And things just keep getting stranger and stranger and stranger. Over the next few hours, in the midst of trying to put together this wildly confusing puzzle, authorities are notified of a call that came into the non-emergency line. And this call was placed by Andrew Carlson. Andrew, shortly after authorities left the Tumwater Hotel, called in to report Oakley as missing and claimed that he and Jordan hadn't seen her since November 30th, 2021. So according to their timeline, she had been missing about a week. So timelines are all over the place. We've got people that haven't seen Oakley for a year. We've got the family being uncooperative saying they haven't seen her in a week, which still isn't good because they still failed to report her as missing. But what this did do was open the floodgates and allow authorities to have the right to go and question the family because Andrew himself had opened up a missing persons report for Oakley. Authorities immediately went back to Jordan and Andrew to question them again, but the couple remained highly uncooperative. Jordan was still in particular being very aggressive. Andrew just seemed like dazed and confused. And this is just not painting a great picture, you guys. It took authorities demanding to see Oakley for her family to finally report her as missing. But they report her as missing just moments after claiming she is in a handful of different locations, safe and well, which was proven to be a lie. And once they did finally report her missing, when authorities tried to gather whatever information they could, they're still remaining hostile and uncooperative. And you would think a parent concerned about their child that once to find them that hasn't seen their child in a week would want to hand over whatever possible for their loved one to be found. And that is just not at all what's happening here. And so for the second time, authorities have no choice but to leave because her parents will not say a word. According to Sergeant Paul Logan of Grays Harbor County, he says, quote, the responses to the fairly simple questions were met with hostility and answers that didn't make sense. They were essentially just rambling off whatever, and it was confusing the entire situation that much further. But just as authorities are leaving this family for the second time, they get another friend frantic phone call. And this time it is from the principal, Jessica Swift. As soon as authorities had left this time, Jordan immediately called into the school where their six-year-old daughter attended and said, hey, look, I'm coming to pick her up immediately. We have a family emergency. So they're scrambling, trying to figure out what they can do. But even more strange, Jordan, despite making this frantic phone call about some family emergency, never ended up showing up to pick her daughter up. So for a third time, authorities head out to speak to Jordan and Andrew, who at this point have checked out of the hotel and they are back at their home in Oakville, which by the way, is smack in the middle of 300 acres of land. And when authorities are questioning the couple at this point, Jordan is still remaining very hostile, refusing to cooperate, being very angry. But Andrew, it seems at least in my opinion, I am not a professional, that he was getting a bit frantic. It seems he was starting to panic under the pressure. So in the midst of this questioning, he starts to say strange things, all alluding to the fact that Oakley was possibly dead. And because it was just frantic rambling and no one could really make sense of what he was saying and they were just having to piece things together, it wasn't like a confession of any sort. They could get no actual helpful information from this. It wasn't incredibly clear what he was saying, but it was enough for authorities to say, you know what? 
Absolutely not. So both Jordan and Andrew were arrested. Jordan for obstructing an officer and both of them on suspicion of first degree manslaughter. And this meant that both Jordan and Andrew were put on a 72 hour hold as authorities desperately tried to puzzle things together and have enough evidence to formally press charges. So the timer was started and authorities hit the ground running, bringing in the state patrol and the FBI to insist in the investigation. They needed to find Oakley or some sort of evidence as to what happened to her to keep the parents in custody because clearly something wasn't right. Right away, Oakley's siblings were brought in for forensic interviews. They were checked over by doctors and were going to be sent out to immediate foster care um, to be taken care of while their parents were incarcerated and until they could figure out more information. And what these kids said is just beyond shocking and disgusting. So Oakley's six-year-old sister told authorities that she had specifically been told by her mother, Jordan, not to speak about Oakley. And so for a while, she sat silent. She was trying to obey her mother's orders, but eventually she became upset and started to open up and told investigators that her mother told her Oakley had gone into the woods and been eaten by wolves. Can you just begin to imagine the level of fear that that poor little girl probably had upon hearing that about her little sister? It makes me sick to my stomach. And obviously the two-year-old little brother couldn't really be questioned about anything. He was such a little baby. Um, but the oldest, the nine-year-old, also had a lot to say. He claimed that what he witnessed in that home was a horrifying amount of abuse, specifically towards Oakley. He saw Andrew and Jordan hit her repeatedly. Um, she was allegedly hit with belts. He said that Andrew and Jordan would lock her in a closet where she would scream to get out until the point of passing out. And he said that his constant fear whenever he was over there was that Oakley was going to basically starve to death in front of him because he claimed that Andrew and Jordan refused to feed her, which might explain why Oakley looked the way that she did in Christmas of 2020. And even more gut-wrenching, both the six and the nine-year-old had claimed in their interviews that Oakley did not make it out of the fire, but they didn't really specify what exactly that meant. Now, the following day upon hearing this, searches began at the property and authorities began to dig into whatever data and history of the family they could get their hands on to try to see if it gave them any sort of timeline, any sort of hints, because as I stated, that entire two years is just a big blur, especially the last year when it seems that the family really cut contact with essentially everyone and nobody saw Oakley. And keep in mind as well, during all of this, we're talking about the pandemic. This is peak pandemic time when no one's going out. No telling what the functioning of DCYF was like at the time in this particular area. It was just prime circumstances for nobody to notice that this little girl was gone. While Jordan and Andrew had claimed when they reported Oakley as missing that they last saw her November 30th, 2021, authorities were able to narrow down that the last verified sighting of Oakley was January 27th, 2021. And what makes this so much worse is that this verified sighting was from someone that worked with DCYF. They had actually gone to check on Oakley and her siblings after there was the complaint called in from Oakley's grandmother and Jamie Jo Hiles. Now, despite the fact that it seemed what they had to say was ignored, it turned out that DCYF had in fact gone again to check on the kids and it also opened a case report. Like they were supposed to be investigating what was going on at this house and Oakley's well being. While DCYF refuses to release information on this particular case and does not take a rocket scientist or anything other than common sense to see that it was very clearly mishandled. Because on March 24th, 2021, just a month after the case had been opened, DCYF obviously tried to check on Oakley again, probably to follow up on the case because they reached out to Jamie Jo Hiles and said, hey, have you seen Oakley? Do you have any idea where she is? So they, by their own admission at this point, have absolutely no idea where Oakley is. And it can be confirmed that they never found her because the verified last time she was seen was by the DCYF worker a month prior. And regardless of all of that, despite the fact that they never were able to find Oakley, they could never fully confirm she was okay to close this case, they freaking closed it anyway. They stopped searching for Oakley 
and did nothing. You guys, if Oakley had been missing at this point, if something had already happened to her, this could have been a prime opportunity to jump on it and figure it out and let authorities take over, but they quite literally just dropped it. And the chances that something had happened to Oakley in that time frame are incredibly high because the last credible sighting, which is different from a verified sighting, was February 10th, 2021. So just before they couldn't find Oakley and just decided to close the case. And while all of this is happening, while authorities are searching for Oakley, trying to figure out how this even happened to begin with, um, DCYF calls Jamie Joe and says, hey, by the way, you know, we need you to take Oakley's little brother and Oakley when we find her. But they made it seem, according to Eric Kyles himself, they made it seem that she was just like with somebody else. They totally failed to mention that Oakley was straight up missing and the severity of the situation or the fact that her parents were literally sitting in jail on suspected manslaughter charges in regards to Oakley. And it's probably because they knew, they knew that this all could have been prevented and that Jamie Joe and Eric did their damnness to try to stop it. So it wasn't until later on that Jamie Joe and Eric Hiles realized what exactly was happening. Authorities also wanted to look deeper into the fire from November of 2020 after what both Oakley siblings had said, because after all, they said Oakley didn't survive the fire. And so they managed to find when looking back that this wasn't just a small fire, like Andrew kind of made it seem to be in his 911 call. He's like, oh yeah, fire earlier this morning, you know, but it's fine. No one needs to come out here. Well, that's not really how things work. And so the fire department went out there anyways. They needed to make sure there was not something going on. And it turned out it had been a decently large fire, you guys. And the fire had not started the way that Andrew claimed. Remember that when he made this call, he specifically said, oh, Oakley started the fire with a lighter. She lit our couch on fire. Well, it turns out that the fire did not start at the couch. It actually started in the microwave. And what's interesting to me about this is that it does appear that something burned hot and hard in that couch area. Now, whether that was just the couch itself, I'm not sure. But when you look at the amount of damage done to the wall behind it, I personally wonder if they found any accelerants or anything, um, whether if they were trying to get rid of evidence that may have been on the couch. But regardless, what he said was just not the truth yet again. And they also found it strange because this fire, like I said, was huge. It had actually gone into the second floor of the home. Why on earth would they not immediately call someone out? to help them. This is everything that they own. Um, this is their children. This is their home. They obviously cannot likely afford to get anything new. And so it's just super weird that they did not call anyone for help right away. Not only that, it shed light on the fact that Jamie Jo had managed to find out about this fire. She saw that there had been a GoFundMe started and that the family, including Oakley, was still living in the home that had so much fire damage. And the fire damage is a safety hazard. Structural failure is a potential when you have a fire like that. And so she had called CPS and been like, hey, you know, is this a concern? Like, should someone go and check? I don't understand. Like, this doesn't seem safe to me. But yet again, she had been completely disregarded and no one knows if CPS or DCYF ever went out there to check on the situation. And at this point, DCYF is totally refusing to put out any public records to answer any FOIA saying, citing the fact that this is an open investigation um, and privacy reasons for the safety of the family. However, it has been pointed out numerous times, even by some local investigative journalists in the area, that they have done multiple FOIAs in regards to children and situations like this and received information back with things redacted. That's a very common thing. So why on earth will they not let go of a single shred of information in regards to Oakley Carlson. She says as much as she and her husband Eric loved being parents, she's done with the foster care system in our state. I will never ever foster another child. And that's what's sad is that I know that there are children that need homes. And I know my husband and I were amazing foster parents. Um, but I could never ever work with DCYF or another foster system again when it's as broken as it is. I know though that what's going to happen and I hope what's going to happen is when um, people request freedom of information they're going to find out some stuff that is really going to um, make DCYF look horrible. Really bad. The Spotlight filed a public disclosure request for records related to Oakley's case. Specifically, we wanted to know who visited Oakley to see if she was okay. 
Were any calls made to DCYF? And if so, who took those intake calls? And what was done about them? Were any investigations opened on the case? Essentially, who was looking out for Oakley? Had anybody gone to check on her or to make sure that her parents weren't using drugs? And here's the response that we got from DCYF. Basically, it says, denied. And to make it look that much more suspicious, authorities had taken the phones from both Andrew and Jordan when they were arrested. They wanted to check and see if there was anything of evidentiary value within the phones. And come to find out, within minutes of the welfare check done by Tumwater Police Department on December 6th, Jordan totally wiped and factory reset her phone. Like, right as they left, she got rid of everything. Now, from what I have seen explained, they're hoping they'll be able to get that information back. But at this point, it seems like they're keeping everything they possibly can find tight to the vest to ensure the integrity of this investigation in case there are ever any charges in the future. Now, while searching the home itself, authorities did find a couple of alarming things as well. They found some blood splatter that was behind the front door down in one of the hallways in the home. They also found what appeared to be a potential bloody handprint. And I know that all of this was in fact collected and sent off for forensic testing, but I have yet to see any of those results released. And also while they were searching the home, they started to notice that, you know, through looking through everything, there was absolutely no sign of Oakley within the home, as if she had never even existed. There were obvious signs um, of the two, six and nine year olds. So we're talking clothing and toys and shoes and all of the typical things that you would see. But there was not a single thing belonging to Oakley. No clothing that would fit her, no shoes, none of her belongings nothing. So it's just like her sister had said, there is no Oakley. By the following day on December 8th, all hands were on deck searching the property because at this point they needed to find some sort of evidence for further charges against Oakley's parents because the 72 hours were coming to a close. And no one knew again what this meant afterwards. Would they get out and immediately destroy some sort of evidence? Would they flee? Like people were hanging on to this for dear life. The FBI was there along with multiple agencies. They had cadaver dogs and helicopters, divers, but this land was incredibly difficult to search. While there's definitely some open space on the land, we're talking 300 acres and a good portion of it was wooded. And it's not just wooded, we're talking serious underbrush like blackberries, thorns, I mean, an absolute nightmare to get through. As authorities were searching, they were also making pleas to the public, posting the most recent photographs they could possibly find of Oakley, which were not taken by her biological parents, um, to try and get people to keep their eye out and hopefully to bring forward tips to lead authorities in some sort of direction. But unfortunately, they ended up finding absolutely no evidence to give them any answers or to further push these manslaughter charges. And so it was announced that these charges were going to be dropped. But... Andrew and Jordan were not getting out because there were new charges to be added. Authorities did find something, it just wasn't in regards to Oakley. So in the search for answers, it ended up being uncovered that Jordan and Andrew had completely been neglecting one of their other children the six-year-old little girl. This little girl is disabled and requires daily medication. And according to what they could find, Andrew and Jordan had stopped refilling her prescription in August of 2020. So it had been over a year that this little girl was not getting her life-saving medication. Quote, the medication is necessary for her physical well-being and puts her at risk for physical impairment and could eventually result in death. They were doing something that they knew could kill their disabled child. So both parents at this point were now facing charges of child endangerment. So at the very least, they were being held while the investigation into Oakley's disappearance was ongoing. Jamie, Joe, and Eric had fought so hard for so long to keep Oakley safe, and their worst fear was just unraveling right before their eyes. Um, there was a change.org petition that was started pretty quickly to push for change. They wanted to push for a new law to protect children in the foster system. They were pushing for a law that would hopefully create more oversight. They wanted there to be a longer monitoring period required when it comes to reunification. I think the average is about six months, 
Um, but when you have such a tricky history of drug use and violence, um, and I mean, as recent as a couple of months before getting their children back, it's definitely something that you should probably pay a little bit more attention to. And vigils and demonstrations were also held for Oakley to demand answers from Jordan and Andrew. They were quite literally standing outside of the Grays Harbor County Jail, just screaming with signs and megaphones, saying that neither of them were going to crack, which honestly kind of surprises me when it comes to Andrew. Um, I mean, he, despite everything, and I am not in any way, shape or form giving this man the benefit of the doubt just to make that clear, but he still made sure to somewhat take care of the children when Jordan would just leave them high and dry. Um, you know, he was the one who broke and gave the phone number for his parents. So I feel like out of the two, he definitely would be the one to crack and give information. And so I was really hoping looking into this that all this chanting and screaming and demanding outside of the jail would eventually get to him and get him to say something. But unfortunately, I have way too high hopes in people and that did not happen. Where is Oakley? Where is Oakley? Where is Oakley? That haunting question is keeping an entire town on edge. They want their unified voices Where is Oakley? to pierce through the walls of this Grays Harbor County Jail and from the sounds of it. People inside this jail Where's your baby at? can hear them. I don't want Jordan and Andrew to think that we have for one second forgotten about Oakley. Where Oakley's foster parents, Jamie Joe and Eric Hiles, are directly yelling at Oakley's biological parents who remain behind bars. Come clean, Jordan. Tell us where she is. Everyone here believes the couple knows what happened to their daughter, but are not confessing. The truth always comes out sooner or later. You know, there's only there's only so much pressure that they're going to be able to take. The rage is not only directed at Jordan Bowers and Andrew Carlson, we want answers. but we also want the Department of Children, Youth and Families. The failure of them to hear our concerns. Make Andrew talk. These people are hurting and they need answers. Where is Oakley? Where is Oakley? Where is Now at this point, the search of the property was coming up empty handed. They didn't find anything, at least not that they released. And so after feeling that they did everything they could, it was announced that the search would be called off and they would just continue to investigate into the case in other ways. So data collection, again, a lot of the same similar types of techniques that are being used in Noel Rodriguez Alvarez's case. And just when you think things could not possibly get worse, the two-year-old and the six-year-old had been given thorough medical examinations when taken out of the custody of Andrew and Jordan. And this included taking their hair follicles and testing them because drug use was a known history within the home. And both children had insanely high levels of methamphetamine in their system, meaning that According to what was released, they at the very least had been repeatedly exposed to meth for the last three months. The two-year-old's levels were actually so high that it was more likely that he had actually physically ingested the meth. How freaking devastating. Now, initially, Andrew and Jordan both entered a not guilty plea to all of the charges, but they did ultimately change it. They both ended up admitting to using methamphetamines around both of their children. And so Andrew ended up pleading guilty to two counts of endangerment with a controlled substance in March of 2022. And he ended up being released in August of that year. And just prior to his release, Jamie Jo actually sent him a letter and she basically begged him to come forward with information saying, please give us information. Please tell us where Oakley is. And she got absolutely no response. And just before being released, the FBI also did the exact same thing. They sat him down, they spoke to him, tried to get him to come clean, say whatever he knew, but he still remained silent. 
And this was incredibly scary because authorities at this point made it very clear that they believed he would either immediately leave town upon being released or he would possibly go on to destroy evidence in regards to Oakley's disappearance. There was literally nothing that could be done about it. Actually ended up releasing him at one in the morning for his own safety because people were getting so angry that they were threatening him at a lot of these demonstrations. So definitely a very tricky situation. Now, Jordan, Jordan also ended up pleading guilty to the same two charges, but because she was already an offender, she already had previous charges. She got the maximum amount, which was 20 months. Um, and so she got that in April of 2022 and was released just this last January. So January of 2023, but she was immediately arrested again, literally as she was walking out, she was cuffed and thrown back in jail on fraud charges. I think specifically identity theft. Now, in a crazy turn of events, which are unrelated, but in my opinion, they're also very telling and could give some insight. After the family had checked out of the extended stay in Tumwater, they ended up finding that the toilet was clogged and like no one thought much of it at first. So they went to go and fix it and pulled out a debit card from the toilet. And so I'm sure they were like, that's weird. They move forward, don't think about it. But after a couple of days, the toilet still won't flush properly. So they have someone else come out and check it. And upon removing the toilet entirely, they find two more debit cards. So someone had flushed three debit cards down this toilet. And the last people to stay in that room were Jordan and Andrew. And so immediately authorities are notified about this and authorities look at all the different debit cards and they're not made up, they're in the names of actual people, but those people had never stayed at this particular hotel before. But what they did have in common was the fact that all of them were in some way or another connected to Jordan. So basically right after authorities had left, not only had she wiped her phone and factory reset it for whatever reason, but she also was flushing evidence of other crimes down the toilet. It turned out that she had been scamming people. She would set up these credit card accounts for people who were struggling. They needed quick money to be able to pay their bills, buy themselves groceries. And then she would totally screw them by setting up debit cards and the names of people she knew and wiring the money from those credit cards to the debit cards to use herself. She put people in like $30,000 of debt, people that were struggling to get by to begin with. And she even did this to her own freak brother, this woman has absolutely zero moral compass whatsoever. And while this isn't directly connected to Oakley's case, the reason this is so scary is because it shows what at least Jordan is capable of. And if anything happened to Oakley in the presence of her biological parents, given the track record, it is very likely that a lot of evidence was destroyed right away. She did originally have a lower bail, but I know that they eventually upped it to $50,000 because just like they said about Andrew, she was considered a flight risk. So they are quite literally still worried that this couple is going to just abscond the moment they are given a chance. People are pissed. No one is getting answers from Oakley's biological parents. And so a lot of people have focused a lot of their rage towards DCYF and their handling of this case understandably. Um, and so an investigation ended up being opened into their handling of a missing five-year-old Oakley Carlson. The little girl from Grace Harbor County hasn't been seen for more than a year and a half. And today we learned Governor Inslee pushed for a review of the investigation into her dis disappearance. He wants to know if there was any wrongdoing by the Department of Children, Youth and Families, which oversees Child Protective Services. The governor sent a letter to the director of the State Office of the Family and Children's Ombuds calling for an investigation. It comes after pressure from a large group of advocates in Grace Harbor County, demanding answers about what was or was not done to make sure that Oakland was okay after she was returned to her biological parents. Neither of them has cooperated in the investigation to find Oakley. At a news conference today, the governor said he just got back the results of the investigation. Obviously, we are all concerned about that, uh, that case. And so I wanted to find out if there was anything amiss that had not been done correctly. And according to this letter, it, it came back and reported that the department had acted in compliance with existing rules and regulations. It doesn't mean that we're still not concerned about the case, but I'm pleased that we got that back. 
However, the letter did say the agency needs to find ways to strengthen the parent-child bond when a kid is removed from a home, basically saying that Oakley's parents should have gotten more time to visit her in foster care. I broke that news to Jamie Jo Hiles, Oakley's foster mother, who raised her from an infant until she was three years old when she was forced to give the little girl back to her biological parents. She's outraged. Jamie Jo says she wants the department to, quote, show integrity and transparency and release the investigation in full that proves no wrongdoing on behalf of not only DCYF, but Washington State as well. If that can't be done, Hiles writes, then she wants an outside agency review of Oakley's DCYF case. She goes on to say that they want justice for their little girl and to make sure this tragedy never happens again. If I had to hear one more time, like, we did what we could, we did what we could, you know, we have to recommend reunification. Like, all of these same trigger sentences hit over and over and over again. All I could think was, if this is the best you can do in your legal power for this child and every other child in your care. Is it not obvious as I'll get out that clearly the laws protecting children absolutely suck? And it's such a crappy situation because people that work with CPS and all these different DCYF agencies, they are overworked. The caseloads specifically in this particular county, I think should be limited to around a dozen. That is what these different employees should be taking on. And even that, in my personal opinion, is a lot. But they cannot manage to keep people at this job because they're treated so poorly and it is such a difficult job that a lot of these employees have double that amount. They've got like over 20 cases that they are trying to oversee. And so nothing at all is working properly. It is like an ungreased freaking wheel that is just not spinning anymore. This is a fully broken system, has ended in so many lives lost and so many things slipping through the cracks. And once that ends up happening, nobody wants to take responsibility. Everyone wants to say, yeah, well, you know, we did what we could and call it a day instead of saying, you know what, maybe what we can do is not good enough. Instead of settling on the fact that you did the bare freaking minimum, how about recognize a problem and fix it? Overhaul has got to be done. And I understand that's easier said than done, but as long as people keep just accepting that same excuse over and over again, instead of demanding change, these kids will keep on falling victim. Everyone to this day is still sitting and waiting for news about Oakley to figure out what may have happened to her. And it seems that authorities are now running on the idea that she is likely no longer alive. Um, the chances are just very, very low. And since there isn't much that is solid, everyone is left with theories and speculation. A lot of people believe that Oakley, just like her siblings, was exposed to meth, but maybe she was exposed to a whole lot of meth and this ended up ending her life and it was subsequently covered up. Seeing as the levels of meth in her siblings were so high and the two-year-old managed to potentially ingest methamphetamines, I don't doubt that this could be a possibility for a single second. But the one thing that I can't stop thinking about when I am tossing around the idea of that theory is the fact that there are all of these claims of abuse towards Oakley that have been made by her nine-year-old brother that makes it seem that maybe what happened to Oakley was possibly intentional. There is clearly hatred towards that poor little girl for some unknown reason. There have also been a few rumors that Oakley may have potentially been sold. Since Jordan would allegedly do whatever she needed to for money in order to gamble and buy drugs, she dabbled in a lot of questionable activities and with a lot of questionable people, there's always the possibility that she had some link to the trafficking world. However, authorities have looked directly into this possibility from day one. This is something that they had considered. But according to what they have stated, they've even spoke to people that used drugs with Jordan and Andrew sold them drugs. Like they have tracked down everyone they can. And those people have been as forthcoming as you could hope. And so far they have not found any evidence at all to support this idea. But some believe that maybe it wasn't exactly like that. Maybe this wasn't like a trafficking type of situation. And instead Oakley was just given to someone else like an underground adoption type of thing. And I think the main reason why a lot of people believe this is possible is because of the fact that all of Oakley's belongings 
were missing from the home. If it was a trafficking situation, no one's gonna pack up her things and send her off to be trafficked and sold to someone with belongings. But if she is being given to someone else in some underground adoption, it's very likely all of her things would have been packed up and sent with her. And since clearly Jordan would do absolutely anything for a buck, people will pay a lot of money for these underground adoptions if they can't be accepted as a potential adoptive parent in the legal realm of things. Now, another one of the theories that has been spoken about is the fact that Oakley may have potentially left the house on her own. Considering what she was potentially going through, according to statements from her siblings, you can see why she might decide to do that. If she was unhappy, if she was scared, if she was being harmed or tortured or not fed, it's possible she just decided one day to walk out. But unfortunately, given the layout of this land, the fact that they are like three quarters of a mile to a mile away from neighbors, they're sitting in the middle of 300 acres. The possibility that she would have safely managed to get herself somewhere is just slim to none. Now, I personally don't know how likely this would be. I feel like the likelihood of it is really based off of the personality of Oakley. And if those that know her close enough think that she would have had the mindset to be like, forget this, I am leaving, I'm getting myself to safety. But regardless, if she had decided to do this, there's potentially a year that passed before anyone looked for her. And obviously people still worry that there may be some truth behind this Oakley being eaten by wolves story that Jordan gave their children. Authorities have reassured the community there are no wolves in this area. So it's more likely this was just a made up story to scare these children into silence, which just makes me that much angrier. And lastly, the biggest theory is maybe something happened at this fire that occurred back in November of 2021. The truth of the matter is that the timeline is very unknown still. While there is a verified sighting of Oakley in January of 2021, because they weren't speaking to family, and on top of that, the pandemic and different restrictions, I think it's very possible she could have still been in the home for a while. And it doesn't necessarily mean something happened directly after January 2021. Um, and if that's the case, a lot of people worry if maybe her siblings are right, that something happened to Oakley in that fire, whether intentional or not. I make it a point to say, that no one needs to come out. Why not call until hours after you just let the fire burn? There's just so many sketchy things, but I feel that if something had happened to Oakley in that fire, it would have been found. Evidence of it, teeth, fragments of bone. So I feel like it's way more likely this fire was either to destroy some sort of evidence or possibly just another scam to get a pocket full of cash. The only people that can potentially answer any of these questions are the same people who are refusing to say a single word. And I am hoping beyond everything that one of them eventually grows a conscience and comes forward. Thankfully, as of last month, there's a new age progression that has been released because as I stated, they were working with photos from when Oakley was much younger because it seems that Oakley's biological parents did not care enough about her to take any current photos of her or cooperate to give any that they may have had. And so this age progression has been put forward into the media. They are trying to circulate it as far and wide as possible, hoping that maybe it will bring attention back to this case and bring someone forward. If she was sold, if she did run away, if she is somehow by some crazy miracle out there, maybe this will help somebody recognize her. Oakley's paternal grandparents have remained pretty quiet in the midst of all of this, making a statement that they want their privacy. And the Hiles themselves have continued to speak up and demand answers to this day. And they have absolutely no intentions of slowing down or stopping. Now, thankfully, they have been backed by a pretty amazing group called Light the Way Missing Persons Advocacy that has helped them navigate through this very challenging time and has helped them accomplish a lot of really, really awesome things, you guys. They have helped them create a website, which I will have linked down below. Um, you can actually sign up for newsletters. It was one of the very first things that I did. So if they have any upcoming events or news about Oakley, you will get them right to your inbox as soon as they can get those emails out. Um, they've also helped them create YouTube videos. Uh, they have helped raise $50,000 to go towards the reward after having an auction and a dinner called Paint the Night Pink. There are a lot of people standing behind Oakley and the Hiles hoping to have some answers and to hopefully bring Oakley home. On top of that, they are still to this day fighting for changes in the law. This last January of 2023, Oakley's house bill was written. The same thing that they were pushing for had finally come to life after that change.org petition managed to get
get like 7,000 signatures in just a couple of days. And the goal of this house bill was quote, maintaining the safety of children who have been removed from parents based on abuse, neglect, or abandonment, because no child at all deserves what happened to Oakley. And seeing as Jordan and Andrew had very obviously still been using methamphetamines based on their children's exams, something as simple as requiring drug testing for those that had their children taken away due to drug use, could potentially save someone's life and could have saved Oakley. Unfortunately, from what I've seen, this law has kind of fizzled out, which I don't want anyone to hear that and panic if you are someone in support of a law like that going into place, because it is very common for the first run of things to just not work out and need some adjustments. It seems that the biggest issues with Oakley's house bill is that they're worried it will increase the workload of these already overworked employees working with CPS, DCYF, and these different agencies, which I completely understand. As I stated, there needs to be an entire overhaul of the system. A lot of people came forward to speak out about the fact that there need to be more resources available to parents that are not just these DCYF and CPS workers, which I completely stand by as well. And they're also worried that this will unfairly target parents battling drug use, pose no threat whatsoever to the safety of their children. So there's a lot of different kinks and issues within it, but, but many are hoping to see the bill back in discussion in the near future. And so other than the age progression, there have been no new updates about Oakley and the investigation into her disappearance. The reward has now made its way up to $85,000 for anyone who may have information that leads to the whereabouts of Oakley or whatever happened to her. So make sure that you share her missing persons poster, this video, um, any of the news coverage that you can find. Also, if you go to Oakley's website that I have linked down below, they have the posters in English and Spanish that you can print out and post all over your town. So while someone out there usually knows something, that same cliche saying that everyone laughs at is the truth. However, in this case, I have this incredibly strong gut feeling it's going to take Andrew or Jordan confessing to whatever happened for the truth to come out. And so I am sitting here crossing my fingers that somehow someone manages to get through to either one of Oakley's biological parents so that they can say what happened to her, where she went, accident or not whatever happened to her, she did not deserve and she deserves justice. On that note, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Oakley's story. All of the sources that I used for this video are linked down below. And also if you need to get in touch with anyone with information regarding Oakley's disappearance, it's also directly below. It's the first thing you're going to see in the description box. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.